But these imposing giants served several purposes, in addition to the stately aura which they provided in the area. They were regular assembly points for men of the district, particularly each Sunday after church, where discussions on every topic took place, and solutions were given for every current political issue or local problem. Shushan boys set up their stands on the Road under the cotton tree outside the Biltmore shop to earn their livelihood. The grandeur of the cotton trees gave authority and credence to cotton tree justice, which was regularly dispensed from these venues for the traditional tribal practice, which was still prevalent in that period whereby the respected elders over the hill dealt with reported neighborhood wrongdoing. Firstly, they would receive a complaint. They were, would receive a complaint. They heard the evidence of the various witnesses and persons concerned and handed down their summary judgment, which was always accepted. Otherwise, neighborhood ostracism was the penalty. There's not much heard about cotton tree justice these days, but it was quite a feature of over the hill life in times past. Young boys, in particular, who were, who were caught or reported for cursing, pilfering, ill manners to the elders, or other such bad behavior, it's not bad behavior these days, <laughs> They were summarily dealt with under the cotton tree, receiving the appropriate number of strokes with a belt or a tambourine switch. And frequently, they begged their chastisers, please not to report the infraction to their parents, <laughs> lest they afterwards receive a double dose of punishment when they got home. Quite a contrast from the culture in vogue today when even teachers in our schools are hesitant to apply any form of punishment to children in their classrooms, lest by themselves, lest they themselves be charged with abuse or risk worse at the hands of angry, permissive parents. So generally speaking, a reference to Over the Hill as a means of identity was a method of describing the background and social strata of those who lived south of the hill between Nassau Street on the west and Collins Ward on the east, and that is the western Collins Ward. And within those boundaries were contained the huddled bulk of the black community of the island. The area was densely crowded, both with its residents as well as with their petty shops, barber shops, cafes, bar rooms, tailors and dressmakers, hairdressers, and roadside fruit stands. All the houses were small wooden buildings, seldom more than two bedrooms, plus a dining room and what we called a front room, or a parlor. Today we know it as the living room. But there was all, always, always also a porch on the front, which was the family's communal area every evening after work or school. The elders of the home socialized on the front porch with their neighbors from next door or their neighbors from through the corner, while the youngsters did their homework assignments from school, or played games of hopscotch, shooting marbles, rolling hoops, flying kites, spinning tops, telling old stories, that's O-L-E, not O-L-D, <laughs> old stories, and ring play, a 
until time forbade. The houses were erected on small lots for the most part. Sometimes two houses to a lot. Each site was never more than 30 feet by 40 feet wide and say 50 feet deep with its own small outdoor toilet in the backyard. On the side of each house in the yard was a clothes line and a sunken well that provided all the family's water needs for drinking, for cleaning, and for washing. And in whatever yard space that was left, a small garden could always be found with a usual patch of vegetables, some flowers, and two or three fruit trees. The entire area was remarkable in those days for what was then still the fertile soil. And one could always found, find a supply of locally grown gannets, juju, that's jujus, dillies, sapodillas, tamarinds, warbles, mammies and mammy supporters, hog plums and scarlet plums, star apples, mangoes, citrus of all kinds, almonds, gooseberries, sea grapes, sugar, sugar apples, sour sops, and bananas. Over the hill was also a wonderful source of typical Bahamian food. Many of the regular dishes indigenous to the Over the Hill district were really native dishes perpetuated by homemakers from the African forebears. And many of those dishes <coughs> sad, are hardly seen today. But as a boy, I regularly feasted on fufu, okra soup, akara, coconut jimmy, crab and dough, Wawa duff, pig's feet or, or sheep belly sauce, yellow cornmeal, giddy, stew fish, and scorch conch. Not many of our residents could afford to eat in the few native restaurants that then existed. But for the more affluent waiters, dri uh, truck drivers, mechanics, artisans, and government workers who earned 